Good evening, and welcome to the Deacon Edge, to this very special Wheeler Centre event. Lovely to see so many of you out this evening for tonight's guest. Judging from your applause, you're in the right place, and you probably don't need a lengthy introduction, uh, but he is one of our finest writers, the author of 19 books, a three-time winner of the Miles Franklin Award. Did I get that wrong, 19? It's fine, it's fine. We'll stay with it. Yeah, we'll stick with it? Stay okay. <laughs> Allegedly the author of 19 books, uh, three-time winner of the Miles Franklin Award, two-time winner of the Man Booker Prize, uh, and an extraordinary writer. Please, once again, welcome Peter Carey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we're lucky enough to have Peter back here amongst us to talk about his new book, Amnesia. But it has to be said, reading the book, it feels like you've never been that far away from us at all. It is amongst many things, uh, a love letter to Australia and to, uh, in particular, bits of Melbourne mm. in the kind of late 70s, early 80s. Is it vivid in your mind, the time and place? Yes, it is very. I, I, I think I didn't know how, how... One doesn't know until one starts to think about it and make notes and write things down and tell lies a little bit. Uh, and so, yes, it is really there, and even though I have to confess I ran away to Sydney in 1973 um, that part of my life in Melbourne is very very close to my heart and of course I, I grew up in Bacchus Marsh where Melbourne was the big big city I used to get a headache just coming here and when I was a teenager it was so terrifying I'd come on the train and sort of walk up you know Burke Street or Collins Street and go around the block and come back and make sure the station was still there. Uh, the enormous size of the city was uh, overpowering. Mean, anyway, I sort of grew up here in a way. It's, you should be warned that moving to New York is acceptable. Moving to Sydney is unforgivable. That's tough. So, yes, I know. Um, I know. I used to, to listen careful. to John Cain's speeches at the Premier's Awards. Uh, <laughs> Chastising. Oh, yes, on, on that very subject. Uh, fair enough, too. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned Bacchus Marsh, and I'm going to ask a question that comes very much from your new book, Amnesia. Tell us about magpie season in Bacchus Marsh. Oh, well. my God, yes. Well, see, there are certain traumas. I mean, this book is about a sort of a trauma, but there's certain childhood traumas, of course, which the whole question of the dunny, as we call it, was way up the back. You, you, the, 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 the classroom was at the front, near Lerderdurg Street, um, if you wanted to go to the dunny, you had to go. And during the magpie season, those magpies were very fierce. And everyone got running up, waving a stick around their head, these little boys and girls running up like this and coming back with blood streaming down their faces. And kids who'd be too nervous to take their business up there did it in their pants rather than face the magpies. Um, I'm perhaps exaggerating and perhaps but I do remember. I remember the smell. <laughs> so, yes. it, it forms a vivid description in the book because your central character, Felix Moore, is a journalist who uh, is the son of used car dealers from Bacchus Marsh, shares certain things with your, your own biographical details. A lot. But then deviates. A lot. Well, not biographical, more geographical. Probably. Is that just provoking uh, lazy critics who always want to see you in your character? Well, you know, whenever I've written a book, and, and I'm always really pleased and excited and proud to make stuff up. And so when I go to all this trouble to invent a character and a person like that, and I discover that Oscar and Oscar and Lucinda is really me, <laughs> and that the poor little deformed Tristan Smith who lives inside a mouse suit is really me, and that great brawling painter from Bacchus Marsh, Butcher Bones, has to be me. Um, I just thought with this book I might just put all my biographical stuff and give them to this character uh, because it must by, be, now, be really obvious it's not me. <laughs> so he, he, he's, born, he's born in Bacchus Marsh and I'll go up to Bacchus Marsh on Friday night and, and, and I'll have to face my sister who will have read this and she'll know that people will think that our mother disappeared from our life, <laughs> that our father couldn't think about it and would weep, weep every time he was talk, he was spoken to about it. And of course, this is not true, but I've warned her that I've done it once again. 
I read in an earlier interview that your sister was really the only one in your family who did read your books. Is that... Well, my, my, yes, my, 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 my mother thought that was generally rather bad form and my sister was sort of sucking up. Uh, and uh, and, I, and, I, and I, I do remember a, a certain... Thing. Well, my mother didn't want to make too much fuss on me. She thought that was bad and you didn't do that. She didn't want me to be a big noise. Uh, and uh, so I do remember a certain occasion uh, uh, sitting with her and some local women, and one woman said, oh, you, it was after the Booker Prize. She said, they said, you must be so proud of Peter. And she said, yes, every mother has her favorite son. Mine is Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she, was, uh, she was herself. <laughs> The, um, but you first had the experience of being an expatriate, not from Australia, but from Bacchus Marsh, going to Geelong, uh, ah, which yes. is a nice early betrayal. Yeah. Can you... Well, that was... It, it, it's weird to think about. It was sort of one of those things, as a child, I always knew lay ahead of me, and, and that I was going to this place where people spoke in sort of... Often in well, in my brother's rendition, because he'd been there earlier, in, in sort of English accents, and called each other by their surnames, and uh, um, and it was a boarding school, and I was going away from home, but I knew it was there was no escaping it, you know, there was wasn't anything, so I went, and uh, and I was decided to be a happy camper, but uh, the fact that as the only thing I've ever learnt from a critic, I think, is, is the observation that my books are always full of orphans. I always thought I was doing it because that was easier, because you didn't have to make up the rest of the family. But, but, but I think actually maybe going to Geelong Grammar at that age did pay its toll. And of course it was a change of class. And uh, to this day, I, I still, the, sort of the trauma of how, how one speaks so to speak, yes, I'd, I spoke arriving at Geelong Grammar and the way I said certain words led to certain mockery, you know. So to this day, I still, I still uh, alternate between dance and dance, um, on castle and castle, where I was, I was informed incorrectly that only Americans say castle, which of course was very bad. Um, so it had, its tra it had its traumas, yes. You say, you say you decided to be a happy camper, but I read in an interview you did with the Paris Review, uh, you came across your report from your housemaster at Geelong Grammar in 1960, who said you were very intense and serious-minded. He needs to have his leg pulled and learn to laugh at himself. Yeah. It may be better to concentrate on the pure maths next term. <laughs> well, that's what comes from being misunderstood. <laughs> it, was, it, it was in fact my housemaster who, who, uh, who had discovered a book by C.P. Snow called The Two Cultures and so which he, the title makes it obvious if you don't know the, the work that you know, and, and it's, a, it was, it's a fair enough point you know that you know, the, the humanities and the sciences seem to be separated and people who are literate in one are often not literate in the other and uh, because I, was a, I just used to argue with him all the time about this because he sort of irritated me. And uh, so he, he got, needs to have his leg pulled well. <laughs> I like you've proved him wrong. He can yeah. get stuff. Oh, well, it was a report from the, the headmaster that said, must be careful, he doesn't become a narrow-minded scientist. Congratulations. I'm, <laughs> I'm just narrow-minded, that's all. You avoided that fate. We're going to continue tracking through your biographical details because they continue to match Felix's at this point, going off to Monash he University. But he didn't go to Geelong Grammar. No, that's true. He went he to went, high school in Ballarat. He jumped straight from Bacchus Marsh to Ballarat to Monash. That's you right. Mm. took a sidestep, but mm. met up again in Monash. Was Monash University formed you, made you the man you are now? Made me the failure I am now. I, 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 uh, Failed science. I, I, I was asked to, to, to speak at a commencement, uh, whatever they're called, ceremony at Monash and graduation. And I said, well, I know why I've been asked here. I've been asked here to talk about failure and the uses of failure because all, that's all that ever happened to me at Monash University where I failed my first year. 
Anyway, the, 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 uh, the, I think the people in the audience were very intense and, and it looked like they were more commerce students <laughs> who, who didn't really appreciate the notion of failure at all and their, their parents looked even less happy. Um, the faculty enjoyed the speech, but I don't think anybody <laughs> else did. Uh, so, you know, I went to Monash for a year. It can hardly... If, I don't know what effect it had on me, except, you know, I came out of a boys' boarding school and was suddenly not in a boys' boarding school, and, and that was exciting. And, and um, I failed all my exams and crashed my car. And then they gave me supplementary examinations, so I failed them all again. Uh, and um, that was sort of it, really. The, the, the exciting thing about Monash were people like the zoology people, like Jock Marshall, and, and they, they bought paintings. Uh, and, and helped, we, they bought paintings by Cliff Pugh. And we all, the students, helped choose the one they, that's where they were going to have. And so they were an interesting sort of bohemian sort of lot, really. So I think they were instructive. In November 1975, mm. you were working in advertising. In Sydney. Uh, in yeah. Sydney at that point. Uh. For a communist? For a communist? I, well, I read in one interview. You no, mostly you I, worked, for I worked for a lot of communists. Uh, this particular agency was Grey Advertising. The first time I worked for Grey was for Ralph Blunden, who'd been a member of the Communist Party, but he, 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 he was gone by then. So no, it was run by American capitalists. <laughs> so much the better. The, I come, of course, to 1975 and November 1975 because one of the catalysts of this new book, um, and it seems apt given the events of this week, is the Whitlam dismissal. Mm -hmm. um, what's your memories of that day? Well, the funny, I don't remember the day, although I should. I remember being in Melbourne, actually, and Grey Advertising had been a very boring advertising agency, and we turned it around in about two years, and we came down here to win more prizes in the Campaign Palace, and we were very happy. But it was also just after the dismissal, and I don't know, I remember making some speech from the stage of, about that, which I don't think anybody was very interested in, but I was. Um, I was very, very angry, like a lot of people, and it seemed impossible that we should tolerate that, and I thought that the um, upper house uh, refusing supply was my understanding, unconstitutional, but our press didn't really want us to look at it that way very much. And it's generally interesting when one looks at the papers in the last couple of days, and if you want to go back and look at the papers from 1975, and so if you see the newspapers with the huge, glorious colour portraits of Goff, um, a position that he deserves in our hearts, or in my heart at least, after three years only of Prime Minister, and inside the tributes to him, well, you look at those papers in 1975, and they're the ones that are helping, assisting seriously in his downfall by spreading misinformation, and da 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 da, da. So I don't know what we make about that, about why he can be deified today, and uh, brought down by them, then. The the anger that you felt is, is palpable in this book, that you continue to feel about those events. And it's anger and it's a kind of grief at the way in which he was treated. Were you a, were you, would you characterise yourself at the time as being very political? I know you're involved in the Vietnam moratorium. Well, you see, there's nothing like, there's nothing like uh, the thought that you or possibly your friends are going to be conscripted and killed to make you take a really active interest in politics and uh, to want to know why exactly somebody would want to do that. And uh, I was one of those people. And so, as I think kids today who people have talked about us not being very political are looking, uh, looking at the fate of hu the human habitat and seeing that they're future cannot really be assured and certainly not those of their children and they're becoming very political because of that, that thing that apparently doesn't happen you know, you know, of climate change and global warming uh, so they've become political too but yes I was political for, I became political for that reason I was uh, in Melbourne on the moratorium committee um, I kept those sort of 
politics. I kept that sort of high functioning level of paranoia. Um, and when I was in Sydney later working for, working for American capitalists, uh, I, I, I still had those feelings and those beliefs. Talk to me a bit more about paranoia, because one of the interesting things in this book uh, is, uh, is characters, particularly Felix, but other characters' conviction that uh, dastardly things are afoot, that there's conspiracy going on. One of the characters, Celine Bellieu, has a moment where she shoots a bird, assuming that it's a drone, mm. and it's kind of laughable and sympathetic that she's so paranoid. And not three chapters later do we see a bird that is a drone. Mm. Um, you seem to be suggesting, at least in fiction, that conspiracy theories should not be too easily dismissed. Really, the word conspiracy theory is really often because it seems like it's sort of something wrong in that. You know, if, if it's a conspiracy theory, no one ever conspires to affect anything. And of course, there are huge, at least in the United States, you know, government agencies whose job with vast car parks full of employees who go to work every day and have superannuation, and if they're lucky, healthcare, whose job it is to conspire and, 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 and to you know, help affect by whatever means uh, what's seen as the, 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 the national good of the United States. So of course things like that happen all the time. And certainly if you, if you, if you, if you think about how the Americans must have felt when uh, that Labour government came to power and they had to listen to Australian cabinet ministers and all sorts of people sort of calling them mass murderers, that would have been really, really shocking because we hadn't been in the habit of doing that sort of thing. And so if they bombed Cambodia, somebody said something. We withdrew our troops from Vietnam, recognised China, did a lot of things that they really didn't like. And then there was Jim Cairns, um, who was, of course, a treasurer who, who was much criticised on the left for trying to make capitalism work so well. Uh, and was known certainly in, in Washington as a communist, had probably been a Marxist, but he was a deputy prime minister. If, if, Goff, if Goff had died, we would have had a communist leading us. And, and I think that, that would really worry them. Uh, and then on top of which, of course, that, that old base up at Pine Gap is really useful today, maybe more useful now if you, want to, if you want to deliver a drone somewhere, probably Pine Gap might be essential for you to do that. And Goff, perhaps recklessly and foolishly, you know, did say, when, when, when the, the lease on this base was about to expire, did say to them, maybe it was the ambassador, Marshall Green, I don't know who he said it to, that uh, he would be inclined to renew the base but if they tried to bounce us, um, he would reconsider the position. And they, so he, 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 he's a very internationally minded man and he's threatened a great power. Uh, I don't think they like that. And we have all sorts of evidence. Uh, there's a cable that was uh, not really pub made public until 1977 where you, you, you see the CIA in a panic with ASIO that Whitlam's not behaving the way they want. And on that particular occasion, Whitlam, Whitlam was revealing that the head of the, of, the, of, the, of the base at Pine Gap was in fact a CIA guy. And that's something that the you know, United States had been denying there was any CIA people in Australia. And, and, and I think SRM call it the, the cable the cable from the CIA is sort of complaining about having to provide fresh alibis for the people at the embassy who were, you know, in defence or whatever they were meant to be in. There's so many, so much evidence of this, and we've had we've had years and years to talk about it. And the sad truth is, I think that the minute anybody says the sort of things that I'm saying now then I'm a sort of a loopy leftist, paranoid conspiracist uh, who's, oh, <laughs> who doesn't even live here anymore. So, um, 
but you'll be on a watch list now. You know that, don't you? Sorry? You'll be on a watch list now. Oh, yes. Um, and, 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 and the Murdoch press has continued to maintain this position. You know, every now and then, like, was it the 40th anniversary? Well, I can't even do my math. 30th. You know, they were saying, you know, there were, there were no cons- you know, conspiracies and da 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 da. So they just keep on saying it, and they will keep on saying it. And I think the evidence is there. I mean, the pre- the, one of the great things that, the, you, well, who remembers the Kemlani loan affair or even what it was or how it all happened? But there was, there was a notion, a ridiculous, ridiculous, stupid notion that we would actually own our own national resources. And we know that's bad. Uh, and, and, and pathetic, anyway. And, and that uh, with the various ministers in the government were trying to raise money, some more expertly than others. And there was a man who got himself involved in this with the name of Kemlani. And, um, and maybe he was a CIA stooge or maybe he was something. But anyway, they tried to raise... And, and, and the deal with Kemlani, as I recall, was that the Labour ministers would get huge sort of commissions from these millions of dollars of, of loans. Anyway, so Kemlani, in the middle of all these scandals that kept on erupting every day, Kemlani arrives in the country and he has two huge briefcases stuffed full of paper, which is the evidence of the venality and criminality of, of, of the Labour Party and the Labour government. And he's surrounded by police because presumably the evidence could be stolen by a waterside worker or something. And, and, and so that was very dramatic and really convincing, but if you want to follow the, that news story, that's it. There was nothing in the bags. There was no story. There was nothing. And so there was a lot of, a lot of that sort of stuff went on. So what might we understand about the Australian character by the fact that these events happened. Our mm. Prime Minister was removed in a bloodless coup, mm. as has often been said, and yet nothing came of it. Yeah, and we uh, forgot. Well, also, our, our, the leader of the ACLU uh, persuaded everybody that they shouldn't do anything about it. I'd forgotten his name. But uh, I think it might have been Bob Hawke, actually. Um, anyway, that's another aside. Um, hmm. Our character, I don't know. I mean, I think there's something in the way we've lived and, and, and the way I can We couldn't really, I think, accept the notion that our great friend and ally would do such a thing, which is why when the, uh, the Murdoch press made it sound a ridiculous idea, we wanted to believe that because it's more comfortable uh, to believe that. I think... We don't have a history. We're blessed, apart from our sort of unsuccessful attempt to exterminate the Aboriginal people. Uh, we, we, we have been blessed with little internal conflict and bloodshed. Um, the blood has not stained the wattle many times. And so I don't know whether we had preparedness to sacrifice everything for the... So the sort of upheaval a resistance to that would have entailed. Certainly, we do know that John Kerr had, had, the, had the army on the ready. That's not a paranoid conspiracy theory. That's something that's documented. So what sort of person would then encourage people to resist this when you sort of know there's going to be the consequence of this would be really serious civil strife? We were not going to do that. Uh, I wonder if, you know, if we'd been a nation, you know, built, established. This is, by the way, this is not to glorify America in any sense, but it's just to talk about their resistance to the British and how they gained that level of independence. Uh, whether that was in our character or it wasn't in our history. Throughout your career, throughout your writing, you have in part being concerned with the retelling of those historical stories. You're a keen Mm. student of um, uh, both Australian history and and broader, and so taking whether it's our bushrangers or our artists Mm. or our convicts or Mm. our... 
you return again and again to those stories that are a comfortable part of our, our myth and what we think of um, our kind of defining tales. Do you think Australia is a culture more predisposed to cultural amnesia than others? Or? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think that, well, look at, look at the United States and the, and the slaughter of the indigenous people and their food supply and the, you know, the grotesque nature. I think most countries have great crimes uh, as part of their history and everybody wants to forget that and not think that it really happened. Um, you know, you couldn't really sing about the land of the free if you really wanted to think about anything, <laughs> really. Um, but I was thinking about, about, you know, the indigenous people of America and their food supply. The, I mean, the, the question about the, the Whitlam dismissal and the relationship between Australia and America is one that you've visited in slightly uh, more kind of abstract terms uh, in, uh, in one of your earlier books, Kristen Smith mm. uh, memorably remarks at one point, uh, it's the periphery shouting at the centre. <laughs> well, I think uh, it's always been a case of the periphery shouting at the centre that you know, if you're my age and you grow up in Australia, you're really aware of being in the periphery and you don't expect anywhere else in the world to know who you are. You, if you write a book, you don't expect them to read it. Um, you, you, we, people of my age, sort of grew up with a, to expect a certain patronising uh, attitude from visiting Brits, and generally with visitors, got no further than the airport before they were asked what they thought of Australia. So we, we, we we've been rather fragile, you know, in that way. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in that kind of Australia and America relationship as one of the lovely things in amnesia is that uh, while it looks backwards at the Whitlam dismissal, it uses an act of cyber terrorism mm. as the kind of oh, reason to go back. Well, I think one of the sort of centre periphery things uh, was I was in New York and uh, my publisher was talking to Assange about uh, a, a, a biography and I started to talk to him. He, he, at a certain stage he said to me, I don't suppose you'd like to write this. And I said, of course not. And he said, yes, of course not. Uh, I, I repeated this to a journalist in London and then it got, it got transmitted in, into the fact that you know, I'd spurned Assange uh, and uh, you know, refused to write his biography. It wasn't like that at all. But the one thing that struck me about Assange then was, well, firstly, he was Australian. And the American politicians were calling him a traitor. So, excuse me, he's an Australian. He's not your citizen. He's an Australian citizen. And I think that sort of level of ignorance about who... And so when I start to look at Assange, I start to, start to think of him as being one of us, is someone who comes from our history. And um, I don't know, still don't know very much about his life because I didn't really want to, but there were a few things at that time occurred to me. You know, well, firstly, I'm, there's Magnetic Island is part of the story, and I'm thinking Queensland, interesting. Mother's a puppeteer thinking hippies and uh, various things. And, and um, he, he has that sort of way of speaking, which I thought sounded Queenslandish. Might not be, but that's what I thought. And, and I thought his mother, oh, I knew this, his mother was a Labor, at least Labour Party or to the left of the Labour Party in the 70s and was harassed by the police during that period. Therefore, I thought, this is somebody who grew up with all the rage and trauma of the dismissal. Wouldn't it be interesting, I thought, to have a character who was like that, not him, but like that, who, whose whole motive for doing what they were doing was really to do with payback for 75. And that, of course, America wouldn't see that for a second. Wouldn't even occur to them that they'd done anything to upset us. No one would know anyway. And Assange, by the way, when he was a... I think still a teenager in Melbourne. They penetrated the NASA uh, 
you know, what do you call it? The, you know. They penetrated NASA, and on the NASA screen, screen it turns up this thing that says, you've been wanked. Uh, and that stood for weapons or somewhere, something against nuclear destruction or something like that. And, and so it had a political purpose to it. But so there were all the disturbed people in a huge panic of this breach of security. I think, what does wank mean? And where are these people coming from? So that's the thing. It was a dead giveaway, it was Australia. Yeah? You're only going to get you being wanked from an Australian. <laughs> only from an Australian. So, um, and, and because I carry a continual sort of sense of America and, and its continual hundred years or more of foreign adventures that, that continues to go into places not really understanding where it is, not maybe not sort of understanding what the tribal uh, structures might be or not having people that speak the language or... Uh, so I just thought they don't know who you are, you're a traitor. I know that... I know that the character I'm going to make up is going to be affected by this, and the book can be about that. So the character that you've made up is Gabby Bailey. She yeah. is the daughter of an old friend of Felix Moore's, and he's drawn into the question of telling her story to somehow humanise her and help, uh, help her proceed through being yeah. uh, public enemy number one. You've got to Australianise her, mate. That's the thing you've got to do, so that people will know she's the girl next door from Coburg, and they won't want to extradite her to the United States and, 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 and execute her. Is to Australianise to render more sympathetic? Yes. Do you think? yes. The, um, how, uh, constructing the character of Gabby, how hard was that? I mean, I, I don't want to assume, but presumably you're not conversant in hacker language or, um, or that kind no, of tech world. How, was, how hard was it to build? That's true, but you, you, there's certain things about me you just can't know. In What's your name? No, I, I, in fact, I used to be a teenage girl. And, 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 and that's all gone behind now, and I like to forget it, actually, talking, talking about traumas. But uh, the, the, the business about hacking, I, of course, knew nothing. Uh, but I like the notion of it. And I, I think, you know, if you, if you want to dedicate yourself to finding out something over a few years' time, then you, you, you can have a fair shot at it. And... There was a woman who was a professor at Hunter College in New York, where I work, and who, who was an artificial intelligence person, and as a young woman, had hacked and helped me understand the most basic things, you know, like the model of computer and the this and the that. And, and I read a lot, and I, re I discovered that there was, uh, there was a... And this is the eccentric part of this, which... This is why Gabby's path... Uh, to political action. It doesn't follow any predictable path because I don't think this would happen to anybody else on earth. But it's, uh, I, I found, I found a, a, an old text a, a computer game called Zork, uh, which is all about an underground place where things happen and there are bad people who leap on you and you get treasure and da da da. And my notion was that the, the kids would hack into the game, crack the game code, and rewrite the narrative of the game. As a writer, I rather liked the idea that they would take control of that world, that they would own it, and that I could write stuff about that. Um, so that's sort of where I began, and I kept on going along. Anyway, finally, um, finally, I really hurt my back. And at the physio, I discovered that uh, the physio had a client who, who worked at Google across the road. And this guy uh, was a very high-level tech guy who had come in to establish a whole lot of things at Google, and he'd basically done that now. And he, he didn't have to work so hard. And so I met with him. And his literary taste was really more for science fiction and uh, that sort of thing. But he indulged me, and he read my manuscript, and to which he responded, and various things like, never going to happen. And, and told me every... And as, as a novelist, this is great to be told these things because you're still going to do them. You've just got to find out how you're going to do them. And he helped me. So, in the first, so I responded to all of those things and talked to him and wrote, among the many things I dealt with in, in the next draft, were his comments. And then we went back a couple more times. And finally, at the end of it, he was sort of astonished that it worked. 
Uh, so in my own sort of weird way, without really being able to do these things, I sort of got to understand the level of it. And I also think got to understand a, a level of the, of the sort of almost aesthetic satisfaction of, of, of taking a complex problems and creating an elegant and beautiful solution, which mathematicians also sometimes experience, I'm told, having failed everything. Um, so um, I, I think it's probably, I'm, I'm waiting, uh, I'm, I'm waiting to hear why I'm a wanker, uh, but so far so good. I mean, when my friends are impressed with that particular thing, I don't really count that for much because they'd be, <laughs> they don't know anything. So they, they'll be impressed by my knowledge of it. I played Zork as a teenager and I believe that you'd played quite a bit of it. No, never. Uh, never. Did you really play yeah. Zork? No, I did. I was <laughs> pleased to say it, make an appearance. That's, that's my dorky past. I don't normally mention that, so that's, that's a bit embarrassing. But I'm interested. One of, the, one of the fascinating things is that the motivation that other people attribute to Gabby uh, as the book evolves isn't necessarily... No, that, that's what Felix thinks. Felix is the one who's obsessed with 1975. And to him, it's absolutely obvious from the beginning when he sees what she's done that it's not what it, he knows what it is. And um, because she's the child of a Labour Party family, it's not like it's not irrelevant to her life. But really, by the time Gabby's interacting with the world, she's really much more concerned of the role of corporations, whether they be American corporations or what corporations, in, in you know, destroying uh, the human environment. And it's as an environmental activist, which the first, uh, her, their, their, their first action uh, above the Merry Creek in Coburg against a agricultural chemical firm that's polluting the environment is a physical one. Uh, she said, if this had happened late, if this had happened later, uh, you know, we would, you know, hack in there and get there, and we would shake it to pieces. Who? who can, just by, just a question: is, Who in the audience has heard of the Stuxnet worm? Yeah, yeah. thanks. That's See, it's a minority, but the 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 the, 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 America, the Americans, you, together with the Israelis and Siemens. Uh, created this worm that basically invaded, Ara uh, uh, invaded Iran, <laughs> got into their computer through, through a USB chip which was put in there manually by somebody, and the result of this was the Iranian uh, centrifuges shook themselves to pieces. So what had happened was that the United States and Israel had invaded Iran and destroyed infrastructure, if you want to call it that, and no one reported it. And the New York Times reported it once. To, my son was reading all about this online because there was a German guy who was a secur security specialist who was breaking down this worm thing every day and, and looking at who might have done it, who might have put it together. He's saying it needs at least one nation state. Then he says it needs two nation states and there's a German ingredient here because of the, this. So my son is telling me this and I'm reading this online. Later, the New York Times acknowledges that this guy is an expert. And for a brief period, when the US government is feeling pissed that, that no one seems to appreciate how tough they've been with Iran, we had a week in the New York Times reporting the Stuxnet worm. And then that stopped. And now, if, you know, you, one thing you know, you don't want to, uh, and if you want people, if you're a journalist and you want people in Washington to talk to you, you do not say Stuxnet. And actually, you try going on Google. It isn't one of the words that comes up, even though you can find it. Uh, so it's somehow not in the search thing. But it's not a mad conspiracy thing. It's real. So Gabby and her generation knows about these things. And she says, rather than this rather audacious and wonderful uh, media event they staged to shame, shame the agrochem agro company, uh, they would have just hacked in there and shook it to bits. So uh, her real hacking adventure is, a, is, is in the physical world. It bothers me actually that we've talked about this book and we've talked about the big ideas behind it and I don't think I've done justice to the fact that... I don't think you have than, either. No, 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 no of course. No. I, it's, 
uh, deep failing. So how funny it is as a book. I mean, the, the, one of the great delights of this book is it is a real romp. And in, in Felix, you have a character who is hapless, the self-styled last left-wing journalist in Australia, mm. who is a kind of accidental and incidental hero mm. who uh, goes from disaster mm. to disaster. And, uh, and his sinister property developer benefactor, Woody Towns. Mm. I've heard you in many interviews describe yourself as a pessimist. And yet this is a book that seems brimming with a kind of anarchic optimism. Well, humour humor and optimism are different things. I do think I'm a pessimist, but I do think that humour is the light and the life. If, and if you're going to write a, a book about a world that's objectively getting darker and darker, you better laugh and you better be able to laugh. Uh, and for me, that is, that's, that's the light in, in, in the darkness because I can't see it. And also, it's, it's sort of compulsive with me. I don't know how else to be, really. So, You said in an interview around the time Jack Maggs came out that your first audience in your mind always had to be Australian. Mm. Is that still the case? Um, well, because I now know I have a n number of American friends, close friends, um, who, who would certainly be on Felix's side politically. Um, and I, do, I, I am aware of them, I suppose. But you, you've really got to anchor yourself somewhere. And if you start worrying, when you decide who are you writing for, you've got to decide it. You can't be sort of writing for you know, a global market or, or an international market. or be, There is no such thing as international literature. Literature always comes out of a place. So this is my place. It's natural that I would do that. Um, so, yeah. But I won't say that I sometimes don't think, and actually it's quite good to, with the Kelly gang and, and with this book, it's quite good to keep in mind the people who don't know shit about what you're talking about. And so you can't take a free ride just by saying, I don't know, uh, Dan Kelly, and we might know who Dan Kelly is, or any or, or geraldry and, and so it's quite it forces you as a storyteller to really tell the story and not cheat and of course um, the other people that you're writing for are, are younger people who, who don't have the same frames of ref reference that you have and you can't assume and you shouldn't assume that they do so there again you go back to tell the story so you don't have to know I like to think there'll be a lot of young readers looking up Jim Cairns off the back of Amnesia to, uh, to better understand. We're going to bring the house lights up and there's a chance for you to ask some questions of Peter. Mr Carey, I'd just like to ask you, are there any particular experiences that have given you courage to write about a whole lot of things from your early stories like war crimes, which I really, really loved, right up to this one? Just experience that, that gave you courage to do this. I, I, I think the thing that I've always... I don't know whether it's to do with courage. It's sort of foolishness, perhaps. But it, in thinking through a story like one you mentioned, war crimes, I'm sort of just trying to follow through the logic of a situation. You know, if this is true, therefore it might be true that that's true. Uh, 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 and so in following that... I, 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 so I like doing that. And when I'm doing those things, I'm by myself. I'm not really thinking, you know, when I was younger, after I'd finished these things, and I'd think, oh, my God, my parents are going to read this. Uh, and, and so I wasn't even very brave at the thought of my parents reading things. But it's, I follow, I, I am aware now that there are consequences to what I write. And that, but I don't know whether it's courage. It's just an interest in following the logical the logic of a situation to its conclusion. And I also think doing that because I am, after all, and have been for a long time, a really ridiculously ambitious person. And so I've wanted to make something new that didn't exist before and something that's at once true to the world we live in, but also strange and dislocated. And that way of thinking sort of leads me to those sort of places. Yeah, almost 20 years ago now, you wrote a uh, quite celebrated 
essay, piece of non-fiction for The New Yorker that was on intensely kind of personal territory. Mm. You haven't written much non-fiction in your career. Uh, was that because you decided it wasn't for you? Or? Um, well, I think now about that piece which involved my first wife, I think I had no right to write it. Um, I, I was living in New York. It was this, she was living here. Uh, it had obsessed me all my life. And Bill Buford from the New Yorker took me to lunch and said he would pay me money to write a short story. And I couldn't think of what I, I didn't want to write a short story, but I said I could write this personal memoir. And he said, fine, and I did it. And later I was really sorry. And, I, and I've, I've not really, writers are such egotistical creatures. You think you write about your life. And isn't that great? And I'm not frightened to write about my life. But of course, when you do that, you're not living, you're not living in, a, in a white room. You're connected to whole lots of other people. And you, so I'd rather not do that again. I've done it a couple of times, but I, I think it's not a great idea. And, and generally, I must say, every time I've set, apart from a couple of small pieces, every time I've set out to write a non-fiction piece, like visiting Sydney or going with my son uh, to Japan. Uh, the truth is I really can't lie straight in bed. I mean, it, 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 I get in there, I, I can't, I really admire good journalism. I cannot do what a good journalist does. I haven't got a chance of doing that because the minute I just want to change how it is. I want to make it interesting and I want to get rid of that and put that in there and, and, and create shape the way I know how to write shape. So I think I should just stay away from it, really. In Amnesia, Felix is before the court accused of making up dialogue, <laughs> and he says he's always accused of making up the things that he didn't make up, the things that were real. <laughs> yeah, and, and he says if your client didn't say um and ah uh, all the time, uh, I wouldn't have to change his quotes. <laughs> so Probably not a legally sound defence, but a good one, no. uh, I think. Uh, another question up the back there. Uh, I'm about to start my year 12 literature exam and I've been fortunate enough to study uh, your collected stories this year. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, just looking for any advice you have in interpreting your stories and kind of... <laughs> I, it's, not as, <laughs> it's not as easy as that, but, you know, getting away from that kind of generic response that I know a lot of examiners hear. And if you could just write it here... <laughs> Relax, don't worry. I am, I am saddened by the fact that you don't... I uh, read something that said you don't have any inclination to go back to short fiction. No, none at, all, none at all. But your, your short stories are... I'm a very big fan of them, and I think they're deservedly studied and read. Mm. Uh, what is it that makes well, you, you feel you, done with you, that you, you don't understand. You see, you write a short... You have an idea for a short story, and you work really hard on it, say and you work harder than I worked on those short stories where I thought a couple of drafts was just fine. Uh, and then you've done it. It's finished. What am I going to do now? Well, you have to write another one. Um, whereas if you write a novel, you see, you have an idea, and it's really just the beginning of an idea, and because you recognise in it that there's some territory you'd like to explore, and you think, I could live with all this stuff for a couple of years... And you set off, and you set off on a really big, big adventure uh, where you're finding people you never knew existed, uh, finding you can write about things like hacking, which you wouldn't have thought you could, or, 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 or a automaton, or, or anything. And it goes on and on. And where you end up at the end of two or three years is in a place you could not have imagined. Um, so, and you with, with characters... Uh, who you've never met and didn't know, and you really don't know yourself. You know, one continually has the, con the, the, the... The terrible thing that occurs between journalists and the writers of fiction is that the journalist's job is to cut through all the bullshit and find out what really happened. And that's, and that's what they are there to do, and the best of them do that all the time. But in the case of a journalist then intersecting with a writer of fiction, it's very difficult because the journalist wants it to come from somewhere. You know, it's really you or it's somebody you knew or it's a character you knew. 
And the writer's whole life is built on the belief that they can make things up out of nothing and things that never existed or people that never existed can be made to get up and walk around and, and, and stay in people's minds. And at the end of the book, the writer has no idea how he got to that character. And the great reward for me at the end of a novel, many, there are many of them, but one of them is to have found these characters that I, I didn't even know existed. So it's a bigger adventure for me. And, um, you know, I, 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 when I wrote those short stories, I'd written three, I think, unsuccessful novels with which, with which I taught myself to write. Uh, and so I'm very lucky, you know, to have had that time to do that. And then I sat down, sort of no longer willing to bet my life on a novel because I knew I was going to screw it up again. And so I started to write these little short stories, which I have said to some people, it's like if you've been trying to build palaces and suddenly you think, I'll just build an interesting little shed and see how that goes. And that's what they were to me. And they worked and they stood up and they were interesting and they were a bit strange. And all the people that had, you know, friends who'd told me my work you know, wasn't quite there yet, suddenly stopped saying that. And I guess I you know, was then at the stage where I had begun to be a writer. And I probably would not, really thinking about it, have gone back to writing novels, except for um, I, <laughs> I, 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 the, the, this first collection came out here, but nowhere else. Uh, and then I wrote another collection because total, I'd been praised. And so I, I did it again, uh, and I was praised again. And so that seemed pretty good. And then my, my agent in London, Deborah Rogers, finally, there's a young guy called Robert McCrum, who was in about 24, who'd arrived at Faber and Faber as a new editor. And she got the stories to him, and he really liked it. And she called me and she said, this is looking really good. Can I tell them you're writing a novel? <laughs> And I said, sure. <laughs> you can tell them I'm writing a novel. And having done that, I sort of started to worry about it. Either, I don't know why, you know, had I told a lie uh, uh, or, or had I... And I started to think about this short story that I'd written that didn't really work. And I sat down to write the novel that became Bliss. And that novel... I only took a year to write it, so I can't ever go back and read it again because I'm nervous. Um, but it seemed to work. I was given the impression that it worked, and I received praise and, and, and uh, a prize or two, I think. And uh, so, and I discovered the joy of the big adventure of the novel, and and I was so drunk on that that I then went off to write this novel, which was so far beyond my ability, my experience. In any way, it's a novel that's called Illywacker, and it's like 600 pages long, and it's totally mad. And um, it's such a leap and a change from, I didn't know I couldn't write it. I just started writing it, and then I realized all these pages are piling up, and that worked. So that was a huge, huge adventure. Uh, I mean, of making stuff up and finding out that you could do these things. So I don't think I would have, after that, didn't want to give up that sort of adventure, really. Herbert Badgery pushed you forward. Herbert Badgery, yes. I'm 139 years old and something of a liar. I say that early to set things straight. <laughs> um, I can't help but notice your advice to your students in no small way uh, reflects your mother's own early advice to you not to be a big noise. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you are very much a big noise and a wonderful writer, and we're thrilled to have you here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.